would say the question of the day is one of my favorite questions ever. Um, a lot of times when we've done the question of the day, um, it's been kind of a repeat, um, something. Um, my goal with the question is to try to encourage us to get our minds going and get us connected a little bit. So, um, how about this question? What makes a good party? I do like the music idea. Um, I do know that there was a small party in my neighborhood last night that I was not invited to that included a hot tub. Um, that would be, that would kind of be nice. Um, hot tub would be good. Um, I think, and I think it's a, a deeper discussion than we could probably have on a Sunday morning together in a few minutes. But I think one of the one of the problems, if I can say it that way, one of the issues, one of the struggles that sometimes our friends who don't go to church have with us who go to church is that we're not very good sometimes, church, about the whole party thing. Like we feel like you shouldn't have too much fun. Like right away we're worried about having too much alcohol or being too loud. Or how silly we look when we dance. Um, and I'm not saying some of those things aren't concerns, but I'm saying some of the hitch and the giddy up with us offering this life that we talk about, this eternal life, this everlasting life, this great life that we have as children of God, is that sometimes we are least fun of the group. And it's a combination of those things, I think, that make a good party. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. As a matter of fact, when we read the scriptures today, as it is more than once, Christ talking about a good party. I will give you a heads up. We're going to read Matthew 22, 1 to 14. And it is an absurd and sometimes scary little parable. What I want to do is kind of unpack it a little bit. Um, but when you first read this parable where Jesus is again describing the kingdom of God. Remember the last few weeks throughout Matthew, what he's been doing, he's been interacting with the religious leaders, the chief priests and the elders, and trying to get them to understand, you were invited, actually, God put you in charge, and you've kind of messed things up. You've made it all about you, and not about the grace of God. And so what God has done now is, God has started to invite other non-religious People, people who weren't inside your inner circle, the chief, the, the tax collectors, and the chief sinners, the prostitutes, the people on the edges, the people who would not come to Sunday school with you, the people who would not be in church at the Presbyterian Church on a Sunday morning. Jesus has seen fit, God has seen fit to further the invitation because the kingdom is so big. And the kingdom is so important. And we, as religious insiders, sometimes haven't done a good job with what we have. So, Matthew 22, 1 to 14. It's a story about a party. And what makes a good party, actually? And actually, you're exactly right. What makes a good party is the people. Everything else is secondary. Everything. The people make the party. Matthew chapter 22, 1 to 14. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. When he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted calf have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention, and they went off, 
one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. A friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him up hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So let's look at this. Um, to be quite honest with you, when I read the scripture for this morning on Monday or Tuesday, my first response was, well, I'm not using that. I'm just going to use Psalm 23. I, I got that down. This is a nasty story in a lot of different ways. The king is going to have a wedding banquet for his son. And he sends out the reserve the date cards, right, that we get now. And they were able to be put up on the side of the refrigerator by the calendar. And people were already talking about not coming. And when the banquet was ready, he sent out his servants. And they refused. They ignored the invitation of the king. That's absurd. He sent out more servants and he said, tell them the fatted calf is killed, the bank was it's going to be an awesome party, it's going to be great music, it's going to be all kinds of good people there, there's going to be some different selections of wine and beer, for those of you who are concerned about that, there's going to be everything that makes a party good is going to be happening, and still, People ignored him. The king. They ignored the king, went back to work, and some even had the audacity to assault the servants and kill some servants. Does that make any sense at all? That's crazy. All he wanted to do was invite them to a party. And the king responds with his own over-the-top violence. This parable is a parable of parables. It's already crazy and becomes more crazy as we go along. The king kills the murderers and burns the city to the ground. Probably his own city, right? In his own kingdom. And still, he wants to have the party. One of the folks I read in preparation for this morning talked about the city burning to the ground and inside the wedding inside the, uh, the uh, kingdom hall where the, the party was going to happen, there was a little uh, can of, uh, what do you the canned gas on fire underneath the food, keeping it warm. There you go. Um, keeping things ready for the party. So all the craziness going on, and he still was ready for the party. And he sent out his servants again, and he said, invite the good and the bad from every corner, from every alley, from every back road. Everybody's welcome. Almost. Then when the party, the absurd, crazy party gets started, the king comes in and he sees a guy who's not dressed in his wedding clothes. Really? And he says to him rather sarcastically, Friend, what are you doing here without the proper clothes on? And the man has no response. And to continue the absurd, crazy parts of this parable, the king says, Tie him up hand and foot. 
and throw him out. And not just out of the party, but throw him out into the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because many are called, but few are chosen. Really? Is this a parable about our God and the kingdom? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Over and over and over, since the beginning of time, God's entire goal is to be in relationship with you and me. And he has invited us over and over again. He's told us the banquet is ready. The fatted calf is killed. The cake is made. The vegetables are on the warmer. The music is ready. Everybody who's everybody is coming. You're invited. Even when we respond with violence, he still invites us. Even when we ignore him, he still invites us. Even when we turn our back on him, he still invites us. Now what happens when we ignore the invitation of God? Then we're not in God's presence. And we choose, by our choice, to have our lives like a burned up city, or to have our lives out in the dark where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's our choice. When we refuse the repeated invitation of God to be in relationship with Him, that's one of the outcomes if we say no. This scripture story, some have said, is about the history of salvation. I would say, it's the story of salvation that continues to be the story for us today. We are invited, good and bad, deserving and undeserving, from the back roads or from downtown. We are invited over and over by God to be his children and to come to his party. And when we do, we're expected to dress properly, which means, I think, we're expected to live a different life. When we answer God's call, we then have different standards. We then have different goals. We then have different ideas about what makes success. So we're invited. We can refuse. And if we refuse, then our life ends up, I think, like a burned up city in the darkness with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. But if we accept it and put on the right clothes and we dance with God, which is things like forgiving somebody 70 times. It is things like giving my last two coins to someone else who needs it. It is something like loving my enemies. It is something like going that second mile when I didn't want to go the first. That's dancing with God. That's putting on your wedding clothes. That's what we're called to. To accept his invitation. And then when we accept that invitation, it's to live a life that is something different than this world offers. To live a life that is something different than this world pushes for. It's a life centered around loving God and loving my neighbors. It comes back to that once again. The kingdom of heaven is life. You and me being invited to a party. God is saying, won't you dance with me just a little bit? Won't you dance with your neighbor just a little bit? Won't you take advantage of my plan for your life? 